everybody to another episode of World of Sumo's Inside the Doyo with me and my co-host Graham Densham. Um, tonight we're joined by a great guest. Um, I'm sure just about everybody that is listening to the podcast tonight will know who this man is and if you don't you need to move out of the rock that you've been living under. Um, <laughs> introducing John Jacksways tonight or as I lovingly call him the coach. Um, coached the Hawaiian sumo team for many years. He's travelled the world doing amateur sumo. He's trained in genuine stables over in Japan. He's met them all. He's seen them all. So we're very excited to have a man who's been experienced in sumo since the mid-70s joining us tonight for a conversation. John, thanks very much for joining us tonight, mate. Um, We really appreciate you taking the time this morning and coming on and talking to us. It's always a pleasure to be talking about sumo, my friend. So <laughs> if that's our topic, I, I'm all in. <laughs> awesome. Great to hear. Um, so we're just going to start getting into it, mate, um, because, guys, we've no plans for the... We've no real set plan for the podcast tonight. We just wanted to get John on and talk and not stick to a, a strict rule, and then we can see where the conversation goes. Um, so... We're going to start just asking you a couple of questions, John, um, and then you just give your experience, mate, and your honest answer, and just just what your view on the on on it is. So, back back in the seventies when you started um, in sumo, how did that come about? How did you find out about sumo? What was the what was the scene in in Hawaii at the time in that, mate? Yeah, okay, uh, I came to Hawaii in nineteen sixty nine out of New York and. Uh, uh, Jesse Takamayama was already, uh, Jesse Kuhaulua, the uh, fighting name Takamayama, was already in Japan and uh, pretty meteoric rise to the, to the near top of the, of the heap. So sumo was a, a pretty popular topic in Hawaii because of their native son doing so well in Japan. And uh, it was on TV. Uh, we got to see like the NHK broadcast, the half hour version of it. And uh, if you wanted to pay a whole lot of money, you could get the, the whole live thing. But we couldn't afford that. We were teachers, my wife and I. So we just watched the free half hour version. And uh, the uh, 442, the famous uh, Japanese fighting unit for the United States Army, uh, had a lot of Hawaii members. And uh, they would bring the pro sumo from Japan over to Hawaii for a junyo for like oh, anywhere from three to five night tournament. And uh, it had happened a couple of times. So I went down to see one of these events. I just went down just because I was a wrestler and a rugger and whatever, just was kind of curious to see live what, what all this talk was about. And uh, we got there a little bit early and uh, the amateur guys were out in the doyo and uh, some kids and some young men and, and a couple of old guys and and they were just kind of doing their little thing and i thought well you know those guys don't look that rugged you know i thought this was like a big badass sport um and then there was an intermission break and uh, i went to get a beer and one of the guys that was in the ring was in front of me getting a beer also a guy named ernie hunt who i consider the godfather of uh, american sumo rebirth uh, a really neat old navy guy that uh, wasn't so old when i first met him and a real proponent of sumo. And I talked to him a little bit, I said, man, how'd you get into that? And so he had lived in Japan, he'd married a Japanese girl when he was in the Navy and uh, just got hooked on sumo. So I talked a little bit and he said, well, you know, we're gonna be here again tomorrow. I said, if you wanna come tomorrow afternoon, you could maybe work out a little bit. And I thought, mm, yeah, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. So two years went by and then th they came back again, the pros to Hawaii and another event. And now sumo was like really big time. and. It was still only Takamiyama. It was like in the early 70s, but uh, it was all over the news and everywhere. And there were now three live, broad, not not live, but three broadcasts, one in English, one in Japanese, and then the one from Japan uh, on television. And uh, there I met that same guy again on the beer line. And he said, hey, I thought you were going to come and join. I said, well, I don't know. He said, well, what? He said, come tomorrow, four o'clock. He said, you don't have to do anything. Just So I showed up the next day at four o'clock. And we got to go into the big arena and go up onto the doyo and like, well, it was kind of spooky stuff, but it was cool. 
And uh, he had about oh, five or six other young guys that were there. And we tussled around a little bit. And I thought, well, you know, I could probably beat these guys if I just practiced a little bit. But we only had like 20 minutes. So we go back to the locker room and I'm going to take off my stuff and go back into the bleachers and watch. And they say, you got to stay with us because we only have five guys and we've got to put the show on for halftime or not halftime, but uh, the warm up for the crowd at seven o'clock. So I didn't want to do it, but I ended up staying and uh, got embarrassed as hell and they, they wouldn't let me wear shorts. I just had my bare butt around there and I'd never done that before. So it was a, except for a few moons in college, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, I got into it that way and uh, it was kind of interesting. So I, I did that and didn't do, do much more about someone for about a year. And then uh, he called me and said that they were going to Japan for 14 days and uh, two of the wrestlers were injured and not able to go on the trip. Everything was already paid for. So he said, if you want to come down Saturday, we're having a little kind of like wrestle off with anybody that wants to show up. He said, the top two placers will get a free trip to Japan when we leave in three weeks. I went, oh, I don't know. So I said, I don't think so. I hung up. My wife said, what was that? I told her, she said, you chicken shit. She said, all these years you talk about what a tough guy you are. They offer you a chance <laughs> to maybe go to Japan. And you say, no, you don't want to do it because you're afraid of wearing the sumo belt. I went out and she said, call them back. So I called them back and uh, went down and and they had like three teenage kids that were like 15 and 16 and a couple of 60 year old guys. So it was like, it was pretty easy to, to, <laughs> to qualify. So I jumped on the team with about two days of practice, uh, not having a clue about anything, what to do, ended up in Tokyo. And the first day we we're at the Coco Geekon against the, the Tokyo All-Stars and just got my ass kicked badly. <laughs> and for two weeks, I think my record was like 195 losses and maybe one win against a, a, a cripple or something. I forget what it is. <laughs> but uh, we got to live in uh, Takasago Bay for three days when Takamiyama was still fighting. We got to meet the Oyakata, the guy with the gigantic head, the old Takasago Oyakata. And uh, it just was very heady time. So. They would, ask, they would take us out after practice or whatever, and all night long, they'd just keep us out drinking and partying until like 2, 3 in the morning, bring us back, drop us in the stable. We'd sleep on the floor. At 6 o'clock, they'd say, anybody want to go practice? And I would always, no matter how bad I felt, say, yeah, I want to go practice. So I'd jump up and run downstairs and put on the belt and got my butt kicked by all the pro guys. And, you know, the, never went with a big guy or a serious guy, just the, all the younger 16, 18, 19-year-old kids that were Jono Kuchi, Joni Don, but I... they, they were good enough. And I just got hooked. So I came home and then Takamiyama came to Hawaii that winter and said, John, would you uh, like to go to Japan for a summer and train? I go, wait, what are you talking about? He, he said, well, they were really impressed by you. I go, impressed by me? Oh, get my butt kick. He said, yeah, but you're the only guy that said, yeah, I want to go practice. And just, you know, he said, no matter how bad you were beaten or bleeding, you just said, Moichi, no, I'll, I'll go again. I'll go. He said, they, they like that. The fact that you're a teacher and a high school wrestling and football coach and a rugby player, they said, they think that if they brought you over to Japan and trained you for a summer in, in one of the pro stables, that you'd come back to Hawaii and maybe help Hawaii improve their sumo a bit. So, so I debated my, my, she wasn't even my wife yet, my, still my girlfriend, uh, said, you know, you should just go do that. She said, don't worry about it. You just go and have fun. I, mm -hmm. So I did it. So the day school let out, I jumped on an airplane, flew to Tokyo and came mm -hmm. back uh, two days before school started again in the fall. And I trained at Miyagi no Beya, where now we're right. a Hakuo. Yeah, well, that's, that's actually what I've got. Um, I've got another question for you about that. Um, because two of my questions, mate, you already covered there with what you were saying. And I loved it because you were just off and see hearing that there. It was absolutely brilliant. That's how I was scared to stop you, mate. I was scared to stop you. But I was like, I better, I better ask him another question. Um, yeah, just so, stop me all the time because I'll no, just mate, ramble. No, not at all. Just... Not when you're telling a story like that because that was awesome. Like that's how I stopped yeah. you at me again over there because I thought, right, we'll get another question in here because I can see this. I can see this story getting really interesting. Um, so, mate, so I, I've got to ask you, what was what was it like? Like, cause see what you just told me, John, where you just met a guy in a line, right, and then he kind of he kind of like try to call you out to you know see how tough you are and then and then your your girlfriend at the time now your wife got in your ear and so that was you no experience but you just you just went for it you're away to japan you're as you say you're getting your butt kicked constantly but 
I, you just constantly get back up again. So see in that frame of mind, that mindset, a young, strong guy, and you've got all these, all these things going on in your life, you find yourself in Japan, standing outside that stable. Tell me what your three months was like there. Tell me, like, tell us like, what happened. And because we actually had read an article, mate, where um, it basically said in the three months that you were there, you got to experience three different levels of the ranks right. while living in there. So I would really love to hear what that was like. And then I know that Graham has got some questions for you about just that and how you did translate it into um, Hawaii when you came back to coach it and, and all of that yeah. stuff. Yeah. So if you could tell us about that, mate, that would be fantastic. Yeah, well, I uh, arrived in Tokyo and uh, a good buddy of mine picked me up at the airport and we went directly to Miyagi no Bay in Tokyo and uh, slid open the shoji screen door. I walked inside and instantly you could smell that binsuke. Uh, if you've ever been around the sumo stable, I mean, the smell of their, their hair pomade is just sweet and lovely. And now every time I smell it, I just get chicken skin because like I, I know what that brings back in me, the, the violence and, and the fun and the excitement and the pain. It just, it just now oh, I smell that and like I'm, I'm kind of like my eyes roll back. And <laughs> so we walked inside and I had never smelled that before. Well, a little bit at the, at the sumo arena in Hawaii, but just a vague whiff. And uh, there were a bunch of guys in Milwaukee. So it was about oh, 11 o'clock in the morning. So the top wrestlers had finished practice and they were off to the bath and the guys were in the kitchen doing chunko bond. So we came in the door and you kind of bowed everybody and I didn't really know what to do. And I walked in with my slippers on, my shoes on and they, oh, no, no, no take your shoe off right there. I just, I was totally clueless. I had no, no concept of what was going on there really. Um, and then they led me down a couple of hallways and then they just told me to sit and wait, wait right there. So I just kind of squatted down on my haunches. My suitcase was out still outside on the street. I kept worrying like someone's going to steal it. I said, no, no, this is Japan. Don't worry. It's it's okay. You just can leave it here. It, it won't go away. <laughs> in Hawaii, you can't leave anything near a spot. It's going to be... <laughs> Same in Scotland. Sometimes you can't even be wearing this stuff, mate. If you look away, <laughs> you'll look down and suddenly your shoes are gone in the middle of the rain. So, no, I mean, that's I, I definitely know what you mean. But I was surprised at that fact and all about Japan where yeah. you literally can leave anything lying in the street. Nobody's stealing anything off you. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a brilliant thing in, in their culture. So go on, mate. Sorry. No, no, uh, that's okay. So uh, I was waiting outside the shoji screen door and all of a sudden the door slid open and uh, they told me step inside. And they said, when you go inside, kneel down and bow with your head and touch the mat with your head uh, from your kneeling position. Just go all the way down and wait for somebody to say something. And this was kind of a broken English because I didn't speak any Japanese and almost nobody in sumo world speaks English. A, a few guys that went to college do, but pretty much English is like verboten in, in uh, sumo world. So I went inside, kneeled down, put my head down, and I just kind of caught a brief glimpse of a guy with a big yukata robe on, uh, the summer robe, because it was summertime. And a, just a huge guy kind of sitting back, leaning on some pillows. And I put my head down and I hear, <laughs> oh, so. so I thought maybe that's why. So I kind of lifted my head up and it was the retired Yokozuna Yoshi Bayama, uh, who was a grand champion. He was the Oyakata. He was the, he was Miege no Oyakata now, no longer Yoshi Bayama, but a grand champion. And, and I had never even heard of his name before, but I just looked at the guy and said, oh man, this guy's been around the world. You can tell he just cauliflower and ears and just scars and, but, but just this beautiful smile and just a, a happy looking guy. So they had me stand up and turn around. Oh, and he's, oh yeah, yeah. He, he was kind of happy, I guess what he saw. And then all of a sudden he looked at me again, no, 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 no. And, they, and they just yanked me out the door. And I had a beard kind of like you have, but a little bit bigger, not Hi. what I have but I had a little bit of a beard and a mustache. They pulled me out and they said, the boss said, you can't stay here for the summer with, with facial hair. That's not allowed in sumo. You have to shave clean. I said, no, man, I've had this for like 20 years. I don't want to. They said, then go home. I said, All right, I'll shave. So they had a rusty old razor. I, I ended up just bleeding in about 20 places, but I, I shaved off what I could. Back inside, oh, yeah. So he stood up, he took off his robe, put it on me, and it, like it was like like an army tent on top of me. He was so much bigger. <laughs> But uh, I was I went over there at 290 because I had been about 240. And then when I got into sumo for the first time in my life, a coach told me if I gained weight, it'd be better. I was told all the way through high school and college and rugby, like, if you drop 20 pounds, John, you'd be faster. You'd be quicker. If you'd lost weight, you'd be sumo said, if you just put on 30 pounds, you'd be pretty awesome. Oh, man, I love more beer, more rice. <laughs> Let's get this going. So 
So I, I bulked up from 240 to 290, knowing that I was going to go to Japan for the summer. I put on 50 pounds in Hawaii. Just to, when I came home three months later, I was a 198. I just I lost 70 75 pounds just because of the the hard work and the sweat and the temperature in Japan in the summertime. Nagoya and Tokyo and Osaka is just unbearable. 9500 degrees and you're you're fighting all all morning long. So, so he gave me the yukata stuff and they sent me up upstairs to get my little mat where I was going to sleep and so forth. They brought me back down to eat lunch and it was just all raw fish and stuff and I I didn't eat my. That's one of the reasons I lost weight is. Mm -hmm. Stable did not have a lot of top wrestlers at that time. One had just retired. He had been a Sekiwaki, Ajingawa, and uh, Mutsurashi, and he had just retired. So he still had his top knot. They hadn't had his retirement ceremony till the fall. And he was a nasty guy. Every time I was doing practice, he'd kind of light his cigarette up, come over and just put it out on my arm or my butt, and he'd have to say thank you and bow. <laughs> so it was just a different world. I think times have gotten a little bit easier now from, from the early 70s. You know, there's a lot more scrutiny going on of, of what's happening in the Bay but back in those days I mean it was bloody awful <laughs> it's like being on a slave ship or something the way you were treated at mm -hmm. the so they told me I was going to go through three phases the first month I would be like a brand new recruit like a Jonakuchi whatever uh -huh. and I would be scrubbing floors and scrubbing toilets and I'd be the first guy up in the morning and put the mawashi on and we'd clean the ring for maybe 45 minutes or so and then do our stretches and skull and in Hawaii, I was doing like 100 to 200 shko. The first day, they told me to do 1,000 shko. <laughs> I had to start falling over at about 400. I just, legs weren't going and nothing. And that's when I got my first couple of cigarettes uh, toasted on, on my butt. It's just like, kind of, and then you find you can get it up and go a little bit more. <laughs> the, second, the second month, they, they treated me more like a middle wrestler, like a Makusta kind of wrestler. So uh. I didn't have to be the first guy up. I wasn't the last guy to eat. I didn't have to clean the toilet bowls and all the other just yucky stuff that, that the young guys have to do. I kind of was just left alone. I, I could do my thing a little bit. And I pretty much I was so new to everything. I was still kind of looking around trying to figure out what I should be doing. But I got to go to the pachinko parlor. I got to walk out and buy a Coke at the store. The first month, I couldn't do any of that stuff. It was just badass nasty and then the third month they said now we're going to treat you like as if you were sekitori as, as if you'd raised up to the uh, makanuchi level and i got to go out with sponsors in the afternoon and the evening and treated to steak and lobster and fancy champagnes and sakes and just all the fancy bars and, and everybody in japan at that time because isf didn't exist and stuff so i was one of the first blonde-haired blue-eyed guys to step in the doyo at koko Gikan or to be in the training arenas We'd be in the back of the training arena. I'd go to sumo school about five days a week for a, a, almost a month in Tokyo. And uh, it was just way in the back bowels of the Koko Gikan is where they have all their training rings. And I'd be back there just doing four hours of practice with all the other young guys. So I didn't have to do that anymore. I just got to travel around. And of course, my sumo did not get any better, but I got to sleep into like eight o'clock. And then, you know, somebody, instead of kicking me awake at five in the morning with a kick in my rib, somebody would tap me gently on the shoulder and Jackson, Jackson, oh, oh, I was, I'm, uh, you know, just sort of totally different treatment. Like it, the boss would be the first one in the tub. I would be the second one in the tub. And then the, 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 they would just go by hierarchy, down, 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 down to the newest recruit would be the last kid in the tub, whatever. So just, mm -hmm. I'd be the first one to eat with the oil. So Oyakata and I would always have lunch together and chokonabe. And there was almost every day chokonabe with a lot of other treats. So it was just a very heady experience. You know? And my sumo never got above about uh, Joni, uh, Sandan Mei. I think I fought mostly with the Sandan Mei and, and some Makusta. So I was right on that border between Sandan Mei, not quite right. Makusta, but... Uh, but it just, it's amazing how many guys are so tough in Japan. You know, mm -hmm. we, could, we could take all the Sandan Mei guys, spread around America, and we'd be the badass sumo, uh, amateur sumo team in the world. I mean, people uh, don't realize that. No, I believe that. I believe that. It's, it's really yeah. interesting because obviously you're talking about how your sumo kind of stayed around about the same level through those three months, you know, even, even with all the work you were putting in. And it kind of strikes me at the way it was set up. Do, do, do you feel like that was done to kind of instill in you a sense of what, of, of, of the other elements of sumo? That you oh, know? Yeah, absolutely. Because like, like most of the world, you know, when we, when any of us watch pro sumo, unless you really become a fan and investigate it, 
you're only seeing the top rank. You're only seeing the, the top of the pyramid. You're seeing Hakuho and Enho and all. You go, wow, you know, this is really cool. You don't realize that there's like near a thousand guys sometimes underneath them that are just busting their ass every day for nothing but just dirt in their face and salt in their eyes and, you know, and just this few scraps of food that are left over in the pan at the, at the end of, of lunch. And uh, they wanted me to, to see this is what sumo is. Here's how you start. This is the nitty gritty, just doggy dog world at the beginning. Then you get to a kind of a mid level where guys get a little bit more comfortable about what they're doing and where they're at. And some guys see a real bright future. And other guys say, well, you know, maybe I'll just hang on for a, another year or two. And then the guys that make it to the to the epitome, to the top of the pyramid, and just what, what a different world it becomes. The sumo just becomes just so incredibly violent and powerful and just like awesome. I would stand in the ring when like uh, one of the top rank, one of the my gosh, uh, wrestlers would, or two of them would go at each other. And if you're standing like around the doyo, which we always were, the thud, like you almost can feel the impact of the air. It's almost like a bomb going off. I mean, it just, it's nothing like, I just watched the American sumo championships and guys are kind of reaching out and grabbing a little bit, you know, and, and this other thing is just like, oh, it's just like, Right. Collection. Like those guys did that. If they did that to me, I'd just be dead. I mean, I would have broken right, right there and died literally in the ring. Because I mean, mm -hmm. you, you take your best rugger from England and, and your best footballer, American footballer, you know, gridiron from America and the strongest MMA guy. And these sumo guys just like they would just rip through them the top of the ranks. They're just they're, and you watch everybody talks, oh, it's so beautiful, and oh, I don't like the way they make them fight so high as up. But when you see these guys, I mean, these are just, they're almost superhuman beings. Uh, they're so trained for so many years to such a, a fine degree of power and technique that it's just, I, I can't describe how awesome it is to be in the doyo, to be right there, three feet from them when, when they're doing their tachi and hitting against each other. And they're spotty, like one, one slap of their spot, it would break half the telephone poles. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're just, they're just freaking awesome. I, I can't describe it any other way. I did get to play rugby uh, in in New York City. The the All Blacks came through on their way to Europe from New Zealand, and they stopped in New York City. And they trained with our team for one evening, well, actually two evenings. But the second evening, they said, "Any Americans want to kind of form a quick fifteen side? We'll just give you a, like a ten minute scrimmage." So I went out and I played against, and I was a tight head prop. Their scrum just completely <laughs> destroyed. I thought I was a pretty good prop. You go against the All Blacks, man, dude. It just there's such a different level to Aye. top pro, a tennis player, yeah, a, a, a volleyballer. It Aye. doesn't matter. It just... I know exactly okay. what I know exactly what you're saying, Coach. It's um, the the. Uh, you can do everybody can do certain sports uh, and they can even take them seriously but there's always a level to every like sport or combat sport where it's just not touchable the level you're at just you can kid yourself on or you can try as hard as you want but there's always in sumo is that for like a sort of collision hard hit in wrestling where you won't find any harder hitters on the planet than, than guys that step in the dojo seven days a week so oh, I couldn't I, agree more there. It's, it's, uh, it's dangerous inside that circle. And I mean, I, I myself, I do amateur sumo. Um, and it's it, even I know it's nowhere near the level of any, even the lowest guys, the way they're hitting each other, they would probably run through half of us, you know what I mean? Because um, it's just, it is, is that's what I'm saying, it's just, it's just a completely different level. Uh, yeah. So Graham, and what was it? Um, I know you were saying to me earlier on. You were we were talking just before we got John on about things we were wanting to talk to him. And Graham had um, a good couple of questions for you, mate, about the what you transitioned from Japan over to um, sumo coaching in Hawaii. So I'll leave you to Graham to get another question off of him because we're both of us are really interested to hear your thoughts on this, mate. Yeah, I guess, I mean, just building on what I asked before, you know, with, with, with the way, um, with the way that obviously Yoshibayama kind of structured your training in that three months, like what from that were you able to bring into yeah. your kind of coaching? Were you able to bring any of that structure over oh, and, yeah. Yeah. and translate that? We, we brought a lot of uh, myself and other guys that went to Japan to do pro sumo. They actually joined pro sumo and stuff and didn't make it to the top, top, whether they got to Joni Don or Sandan or Makusta or Jorio, and then came home. And a lot of those guys came back to help us coach and, and run our programs. And so we, we picked up a lot. Mostly what we picked up is one, 
the, just the respect that, that you just don't do the typical American or, or world thing. Uh, the, the, just the total respect for the sport, for your opponent, for yourself, for your body, for, for how you treat things and people and how you want people to view you. And the, the thing that I brought back to Hawaii, I think most that, that helped me work with the youth of Hawaii because I was a high school football and wrestling coach, a mathematics teacher, and then a vice principal. I usually loved to work with the kids that were hard headed and, and not able to be on the team because they failed their classes or they got in a fist fight or something like that. Those are the kids that I just, I love to work with because that's what I was in high school and college. So I, I could, re and I taught them that uh, I didn't teach them, but we, we led them to realize that in sumo at the end of a match, you should not be able to tell who is the winner or the loser by the decorum that they display. There's no kicking of the sand. There's no punching the ground. There's no staring uh, nasty eye at the referee or at your opponent or like, or, or celebrate jumping up and clapping. Yeah. And running around the ring. I did. I did. I kicked their butt. You know, they said, all that stuff is okay, but that goes on in the locker room or back at home or somewhere that does not happen in the doyo. That does not happen in the public view. That that's a personal thing that you have to deal with and think about yourself. And it really helped a lot of our kids because, you know, in America, you win the basketball game or something, the kid that makes the shot is the hero and everybody else is the goat or whatever. And just and just the rudeness and the, it's all about winning. And in Japan, they say, if you're playing, you won already. You know, and of course, you want to do best and, and get your gold medal and, and be the Yokozuna. But uh, not every, oh, very few guys can do that. So it's more about you win if you play. And the kids oh, yeah. start to understand that. And uh, in Japan, a sumo wrestler is just so freaking proud of being a wrestler that he does not want to do anything in it that he possibly could to bring any kind of shame or embarrassment to him, mm. his coach, family, and the whole tradition, kind of like the, their whole culture is a little bit. And uh, we just tried to instill that in Americans that, you know, just in our boys, that th this is what you got to do, guys. Th this is what it's all about. Right. Second thing is that we really, I think, learned that there's levels of sumo and that's one of the reasons they took me to the beginning to the middle and to the to the the epitome was that uh not everybody's going to start out as being the grand champion not everyone's going to be a badass but you take a kid look at hawk did you ever see the picture of hakuho when he first right. sumo? 69 kilos hey, little fucker. like who would have ever thought he was going to be the goat right the greatest mm -hmm. of all time theoretically whoever right. thought that this little skinny but that's what you see as as things progress and over the years right. having been a, a high school coach and whatever you see that these kids in seventh eighth ninth grade that are not not very they're fat or they're skinny or they're just not tough they're soft these kids come home from college and they're just six foot three 280 pound gorillas you go my god where did you come from boy because there's this so we we teach that to the kids that yeah you may not be beating billy today but you can beat kibo and just keep working on it. just all, all you got to do is make yourself if every day you you get a little bit better it works Right. And the third thing that we really stressed that I learned when they told me to do 500 ko, I just like, oh, are you kidding me? A thousand ko? Like, and I realized that you just do one at a time. Then you know, I do it by tens. I just, okay, I can do 10 more. Then I can do 10 more. And I wasn't counting, but they had one of the young guys behind me, little marking in the in the dirt, the way the Japanese count with their little right. system, counting how many I did. And say, so, okay, a thousand, a uh, uh, hundred, two hundred. And I just, I couldn't think about a hundred. And that made me a better dad. I can't think about the long run all the time. I just got to be in the moment and just deal with what I can deal with right mm -hmm. now. Take yep. care of my kid first and then go worry about something else later. Right. A lot of just life lessons that uh, make make sumo wrestlers, if you really get into it, it, it makes better people. <laughs> I, most, I, sports, I, most sports do it, you know, if you do it right. I definitely. The, um, bringing some discipline to people. Um and and that usually helps a good bit of discipline and and these sports and no there's not many sportsmen in the world that are as disciplined as um rikishi so i definitely think that you you make a great point there where it reflects on the type of person you end up being when you're in that that life a lot and this is the rules and traditions that you're trying to follow something you said when you were talking there john um when you mentioned hakuho and you were saying like the the goat. This is something else that we were wanting to talk to you about, just about periods, because um, everybody can give an opinion. And um, there's a lot of new sumo fans. Uh, COVID seemed to introduce so many new people to sumo right. that, that we noticed. 
So there's a lot more new explaining to do and trying to educate people that might be a wee bit misconstrued about how things do work and are done. So, see, we Hakuho, obviously on paper, in black and white, he's the greatest of all time just because of the numbers. But is would you say that that is the case over an actual period of time where you've been able to not only witness sumo in these time periods, but be able to be part of it and practice and coaching and sending guys to Japan and coming and going with everybody. So you can actually give an educated opinion on this, is my point, whether a lot of people are just humming and hawing just because they've read a Wikipedia article and they're like, right, well, that's me, an expert now. So I've read two pages of Wikipedia and I argued with some guy in a sumo group. So I'm an expert. Everybody listen to me now. You know what I mean? It just, just, I've got no time for it. So, mate, if you I always please... get, some, I, I just gotta say, I always get some chuckles when I read some of these uh, Facebook uh, groups and mm-hmm. people are saying, "Well, why they do that? And that's stupid. He should be." And I go, Aye. "Okay, then whatever." Because <laughs> just... there's, there's only so many times you can explain. You know what I mean? Like the age-old question: Where's Hakuho? Do you think um, Enho's not doing well because Hakuho's not there? Why is Tochi no, no. Ocean get plasters on his butt? It's like, why are you asking these things? This is not important. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter. So yeah. I so I would love to know your opinion on like goats or goat from all the time periods because you right, right, right. Well, I, I think Hakuho has done an amazing, amazing job. Uh Born and raised in Mongolia, he comes from a different culture. It's it's closer to Japanese than, than Americans or Scot or Scotland or whatever, but it's still a different culture. Absolutely. So he travels thousands of miles and leaves his family and his parents and whatever, and, and goes to Japan as a young guy and uh, has to learn the language, has to learn the culture, how to hold the teacup, how to tie your obi. I mean, when you're the yokozuna, if, if your obi is tied crooked, people in Japan get upset about that. If, if your hand do isn't just perfect, people get upset because you're the grand champion. The, the Yokozuna is supposed to be the epitome, the perfect, ultimate Japanese citizen is the Yokozuna. So he's got moral code, he's got soup health, he's got fitness, he's got uh, tenacity, he's got hard work, he's got, he's got respect and honor and dignity. Everything that you can think of rolls into this tight ball that becomes the Yokozuna. And every dad in Japan should be able to tell their son, boy, look at this guy. This is, this is, the, this is the perfect example of, of what a human being can be in Japan. Mm. This is what we strive to be. And not, not all of us can get to that particular level, but, but that's the goal, that, that, that's the dream. So when you just look at numbers, as you said, yeah, without a doubt, he, no, nobody has a, compiled the numbers and the stats that, that he has done and, and his techniques. I mean, he's just an awesome wrestler. Nice. But when you look at the whole thing about being the ultimate Japanese citizen, one, he's not, you know, he was not born and raised Japanese. So even if he has his Japanese citizenship and so forth, he's still not Japanese. Uh, so there's a, just something deep inside that that's a little bit different to the typical Yokozuna. Mm-hmm. Aki Bono had the same thing. Musashi Maro had a little bit of that same thing. I mean, people bring their background with them. You know, you can't just divest yourself of everything that you're born and raised into. You, you have to have a piece of that still left in you. So I, I, I really don't have a problem with, with a little bit of his haughty attitude, a little bit of his kind of strut around the ring and so forth. And lately, people have been talking like, oh, man, that extra shove he gave at the edge. So like, There's no need to do that. He and uh, uh, Teru no Fuji, they're, they're like, in, they're just fighting their butt off. They're, they're not trying to hurt anybody. They're just trying to make sure that they don't lose the match. And sometimes, yeah, you give a guy another little tap. But, hey, these guys are so badass that that extra little tap, the other guys don't take offense. That that's just you no. Know, it's like me slapping you on the shoulder and saying, "Hey, right. don't get out of here." I got you. So I can see how the the real purists in Japan, some of the senior members and so forth, may have a little bit of like you know he's not exactly everything that we would dream him to be. But you look what he's done with his Hakuho Cup. He's bringing thousands of kids from all around the right. world and kind of on his dime, bringing them in. And, of course, it's his sponsors. You know, he, he's not really putting up his own per- – he's doing some. But, I mean, when, when you're that grand champion for that long, he's got he's got industry behind – he's got a whole freaking industry behind him. So mm-hmm. no matter what he does, 
it, it's covered in some way, shape, or form. So he's not ever going to worry about like that's not the money that he was going to use to get a new mm -hmm. car with. They're going to like if you or I did, treated some kids to a trip, we'd say, "Man, well, I, I'm not going to buy the car. I'm going to take this kid to Japan." It's not that way. But he's just done really good things for the sport, and he's brought a mm -hmm. lot of international interest into it. So I think I, I'm still okay with that. The traditional ones, Chiona Fuji, some of the guys I, I really just love, uh, Kitano Umi, Chiona mm -hmm. Fuji, some of those, mm -hmm. Taiho, some of those guys just were like kind of classic, but with the modern way to snoop on people and see absolutely everything that they're doing every step of the day, Aye. the paparazzi kind of shit that goes on. I mean, Aye. nobody, you can't pick your nose in Japan anymore with that. It's not going to be on Facebook, you know, Aye. all over the, the Nihon Shimbun or something. So, Aye. It's just, it's a little bit different world, but I think Japan is struggling right now and how much they internationalize Samoan. I got a little bit frustrated. The Hawaii boys came in. We had a real Hawaii era. We mm -hmm. were just sending so many guys. And, you know, Takamiyama kind of started, and for sure, he, he definitely led that whole charge. Aye. But then Konishiki came along, and he uh, we'd sent three or four boys before Konishiki went, and they did pretty good, but they didn't they didn't get way up there. And then Konishiki went, and boom, he, he went way up there. Aye. And we think that there was definitely some prejudice, but he also, he was being the real honest, the way he was raised in Fa'a Samoa, the way of Samoa by his dad and his family and his culture mm -hmm. was to always just tell the truth. They'd say, well, how do you like those Japanese girls? They go, well, they all, he, he, they all just, they're kind of silly, you know. They, 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 our girls don't do that. Well, what do you think about the subway? Well, it's just kind of busy and crowded. You know? so he'd just say, honestly, oh, that guy's no good. Oh, he's mm. knocking our people. But his dad told him, don't ever tell a lie, son. You always tell the truth. So he just told the truth. You ask him a question, he's not going to sugarcoat it. And mm -hmm. it costs him a lot. It costs him sponsors. It costs him maybe his promotion of the Yokozuna. Oh, so that, that's still questionable whether it would or wouldn't have happened. And well, then really Akebono came by. Know. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. I was going to say it was really interesting when you said the Yokozuna is like the perfect Japanese citizen and where um, Kanishki is kind of, he's just so like, he is so honest. Like he's a, everything I've seen. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he's exact. He's exactly the person that he he portrays himself to be. There's no, no shadows and no screens with him. It's straight right. up. What it is is what it is. Yeah, which is <laughs> lovable. But in Japan, everything is kind of face, and so it, it it's a it was challenging for the Japanese and challenging for Konishiki to try and blend these two cultures. Where this one is like, oh, you just bow and say nice to everybody, and then he's going, no, dude, I'm not bowing to him. He's he's a right. <laughs> So M maybe maybe um, the the way Kanishki went about it, it maybe helped Aki Bono be able to learn, say, right here, here is what I maybe try and do differently to move us to the next step, so each one learn for the next one. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Je Jesse made it to Sekiwaki, mm -hmm. and then Konishki made it to Ozeki, and then Aki mm -hmm. Bono, yeah, they always say, they oh, always yeah. say, Jesse opened up the door, Kunishi climbed the stairs and Akibono stepped into the grand room. <laughs> right. yeah, and then just... and then Musashi Maru made sure that they couldn't be pushed back out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because that's yeah. actually my first ever sumo experience is um I think I was five years old. Um it was nineteen ninety-four and I had woke up at five AM um, and I think I had, had a bad dream, and I can't really remember. But uh, I had went into the living room to put the telly on because I couldn't get back to sleep. And I switched the telly on, and it was Eurosport that was on Channel 4. Uh -huh. um, and Or it might have been another channel, I don't know, but it was Eurosport anyway. And there, i just seen this big, ginormous guy. And straight away, I noticed that, that it was full of Japanese people. This, like, the Koko Gikan was full of Japanese, and even right. the other wrestler was half the size of Musashi Maru, because that's who was standing across from him on the doyo. Um, and I knew he, looked, he just looked different. Like, obviously, he's Hawaiian, so there was a difference in him. I was, he stood out to me for that reason. And he was just a giant. And, and I didn't realise that I was actually watching the bout that won him his first ever U show. I didn't realise that until years later that that's what I had actually watched. That's but from then on, that was me hooked because I had seen this Hawaiian monster. And he was, I, and I mean, the, the Japanese guys were big, but Akibono and Musashi Maru, they say that you think you know what big is. And even Kanishki, I mean, I'm leaving the most important one out. He get the, they get the nickname Dump Truck for a reason. 
because these were ginormous behemoth men yeah. who could also move and all. What other 600 pound man have you ever seen move like Kanishki? I've never. I, I've, I've yeah. watched that my 600 pound life and me and they need stretchers and, and 18 ambulance guys to roll them over on their bed. Kanishki's up there wrestling. So yep, that, yep. that is a testament and a proof to the toughness of the Hawaiian boys for the islands and what they yep. can achieve when they when they when they grind down and, and set their minds to it. So John, that brings me definitely to what's gonna be the most exciting part about this episode about the Hawaiians. Um See when obviously Kanishki's over there, he's breaking down ceilings being Ozeki. See when Aki Bono got that sooner, when when he got the rope. How was that over in the islands? How was that for all of you over there and, and your boy had done it and just all of that? Just how did, how was that as an aura and how was the atmosphere and everybody? And It would be the same as if one of your Scotland boys uh, became a Yokozuna. I mean, mm -hmm. the whole country would kind of rise up in, mm -hmm. in celebration and cheer. And Hawaii, it's kind of amazing. The island, all these guys came from the island of Oahu. The island of Oahu back then had about 800,000 people. Tokyo has 20 million people. Tokyo has had professional sumo for 100 years. These guys have never even knew what it was growing up in high school. Maybe they had heard the name Takamayama, but that was it. I mean, they had nothing to do with it. They go over there cold, and in six, eight years, we've got two Yokozunas and Ozeki, and a bunch of other Sekitori. Like, what the? And Tokyo's going, wait, we haven't had a Tokyo Yokozuna in 25 years. And we got 20 million people and we have sumo in high school and junior high and college and men's amateur and da, 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 da. And it's just, Hawaii just blew the world apart. And, and the Hawaiians, everybody in Hawaii, whether you're Japanese, Korean, it didn't matter. Everybody was a Japanese sumo fan by then. And just any party you went to, the kids in school and people knew I was involved in sumo a little bit. So all of a sudden, instead of me being that silly guy that wears a diaper and the, the, all the fat boys, all of a sudden like, mm -hmm. oh, John, can you talk to us about this? Tell us, hey, what did Aki Bono say to that? Well, how come they're... So people like, all of a sudden, sumo went from being this little oddity to like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> and everybody had sumo pictures on their wall. It was almost like, almost a religious involvement in, in Hawaii. It was really, really fun. And uh, I got to be here and kind of surf that wave. I was just the right place at the right time in the history. Had I been born 10 years oh. earlier or later, I would have just been a nobody and just got, you know, like everybody else just had a nice life. But I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Oh. The first blonde-eyed, blue-eyed guy. And now I, I would I would be nothing at any of these terms. People say, yeah, oh, there's that old butt guy, you know, but it's oh. timing. Timing is everything in life, I guess. And uh, I, I lucked out. Why? What's for you? What's for you won't go by you, John. So it was definitely meant to be, and that's just—it's—it's it's just all dead impressive. Like Ollie, everything you're saying, this is nonchalant to you. You're sitting talking to me and Graham about this, like, because it happened to you. You've—you've you've loved it. No, I mean, you've—you've you've got t-shirts that are that are like. <laughs> that are old, <laughs> that are worn old now. No, I mean, because you're that experienced and stuff. This is—it's. It's it's definitely been fun already. Um, so I may do you know? And I just I just have to say I just if I can interrupt, I just got to say I'm equally as excited to talk with you two guys because we're we're spreading that word a little bit more around the world and, and mm -hmm. your efforts and I watch on uh, the Facebook a lot and and some of these websites and just the whole world is is really starting to understand sumo a tad more rather mm -hmm. than just this strange oddity and all these silly questions you alluded to earlier people Aye. are starting to say like what's the real deal here tell us Aye. more about what sumo really is all about and mm -hmm. that's to me that's that's incredibly exciting i don't have a whole lot of time left in this place you know i, I know that i'm on the i'm on the 18th hole i think but uh, i'm okay i'm doing good i'm smiling i'm happy but uh i've had a wonderful life and some amazing experiences and uh it's just nice to be able to share them and, and help other people understand a little bit more about this amazing thing called sumo. <laughs> it's just I, a great sport. Right. Well, John, you're definitely one of the most positive men that I've ever spoke to. Um, and that's how, I mean, the first time I ever spoke to you was about two years ago. And even then, after a, like, a couple of days of talking to you, I was asking you, like, oh, you'll need to tell me stories and let me interview you one day or something like that. And I'm just so glad that it's full circle because I started World of Sumo to do what you're saying, to stop all these misconceptions and stereotypes. Plus, I wanted a stage to push amateur sumo 
the same because there's this whole, whole other hidden world in it as well. Even in Japan, there's a whole amateur hidden world that people should discover because you don't you don't know what you're missing. There's all these leagues and see once you give it the time and bring yourself into more of an understanding, you, you have to respect and love sumo. Sumo's my life now. I'm a random, I'm a random weirdo through the Middle East Scotland, know what I mean? As you can see behind me, the people listening to this can't see, but you be seeing behind me, this is the church of sumo in here. No, I mean this is this is my life. I, I absolutely love it. I do amateur sumo myself. But I, I, I want to add one more thing. I, I'm not sure how so much more we're going to be talking, but you know, we talked a lot about pro sumo, and I talked about how incredible they were and all the lessons they taught. Yep. But I do want to just say a bit about amateur sumo. I'm just so delighted and, and glad that amateur sumo has taken foot all around the, the world now, and just. In America, we, we were kind of slow getting off, off the start on it, but uh, the last couple of years, there's a lot more folks like you, just young and excited and energetic and just want to learn. And they're the serious kind of guys. They want to play it. They want to know how do you do it better? How do I, how can I improve this? And it's not, you know, it's nice to have the chatter uh, on all the social media and so forth. And, and, and that's good. I mean, without that, you know, it's nice to be somebody that people say, hey, you do some of Well, that's cool. You know, that feels good. It's it's a good thing. We all like fans. We all like spectators and supporters and people that will buy the tickets to so we can have another big tournament or something. But uh, it's just amateur sumo is just growing wonderfully. And uh, I it seems like uh, in the beginning it was Japan was kind of controlling every because they had to. They, they were the source, the fount of, of sumo. So everything was in and out of Tokyo. And now pockets all around the world are kind of doing the doing their sumo. And it, it will drift away from all pure Japanese kind of sumo. When our sumo guys came back from Japan, the guys that made it up to Makushita, Maigashita, whatever, for a few terms and then came home, they came back to help me coach a little bit. And they started to treat our local boys as if they were Japan recruits in a sumo stable. Oh, no, no, and starting to whack them a little bit with the stick and just scold them and make them do an extra 200 to go. And I said, we had like 40 boys for about five practices when these two guys came back. And like three weeks later, we had 10 boys show up. <laughs> the other 30 guys said, I don't want to go back there anymore. This is just stupid. I'm just, the guy just beating the shit out of me. And, you know, I'm not ever going to go to Japan. To be pro. So they just kind of like didn't want to do it. So we kind of had to talk and say, you know, we're not in Japan. This is not Aye. Tokyo. We're not We're not aiming to be Ozumo. What we're aiming to do is teach our boys a wonderful sport that they can mm. do in their 20s and 30s and even 40s or 50s. Football, Aye. you kind of, American football, gridiron, about 25, you're done. Even the pros by 30, that, that's an old pro. You know, Aye. and then the rest of your life, you just sit back and talk about Sumo, you can kind of keep going. And there's so many venues that, that just keep it going. I said, we're trying to make them better citizens and shit, you know. So we don't have to train them to be Ozekis. <laughs> We're not right. trying to get them into Gordio or what. We're just trying to get these boys to be better kids, be better students, be better children. Someday be a better dad, a better husband. Mm -hmm. That's what we're aimed at—a better citizen in our country and have a hell of a lot of fun and develop their body and their strength and right. and wear the T-shirt that says "I belong." I'm the Oahu Sumo Club. I'm the Hawaii Sumo. I'm the world sumo associate whatever it may be international just i belong to something that that is good and positive and, and uplifting rather than a freaking gang or just a bunch of druggies on the corner smoking cigarettes and passing beers around it just so and we all eventually started to really understand that and I, that's i think why japan was interested in me in the beginning is because i i came with that teacher perspective not, not just an athlete's perspective but i was a teacher and a coach and you can't just be a coach and get this, the seventh grade kids out for the first time in football and just beat the shit out because they'll, they'll never Aye. come back and play again. You got to nurture them and build them. And yeah, then at the top, you take your, your top ones and then those guys you put into that crazy zone to, to get them up to be of international caliber or something. Mm -hmm. So for most of us, no, it's just being good people and having a really, and getting to drink sake and eat uh, all the Japanese foods and wear the kimono and the yukatas and just, mm -hmm. just have your posters on the wall like you've got. I mean, that's all wonderful stuff, man. Just all good, positive things that make better people. And, and that's what I love about sumo. It just makes better people. I, uh, I, Scott's, Scott's been talking to me for, for about a year now about I should be I should be wrestling. I should be doing amateur sumo. It's dangerous talking to you because you got me all inspired. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's never too late to start. And again, you don't have to make your goal that you're going to go to Japan and be a Yokozuna. 
your goal could be that you're going to just get in the ring and do some of the exercises and the stretches and do a little boot scotty, just pushing back and forth, maybe have a couple of small bouts with different guys. And then if that feels good, then just kind of take it to another level. Okay. Now I'm going to train a little bit more and just, and then you, you get to where you're at and uh, Mr. Finley and uh, that now it's kind of like, okay, bear down, dude. You know, I, I want to go old too. I don't want to just be a player. I want to, I want to go get something. And that's, that's the higher level. It just, and then, you get to that level and you win some championships. Oh man, now I want to go and win the world tournament. You know, just, I, but the bottom but, line is that you're doing it for you. You're doing it for your health, for your fun, for your enjoyment, and it's yep. an achievement. It's a way. All sports are just wonderful ways to to enhance the human experience. I think I, sumo was like one of the best. <laughs> I no, def definitely. I agree. I agree with you, coach. And I have Graham's right. I have been saying that to him um, because he's ex rugby as well. And Graham could do well. So he could see with the right bit of practice and that Graham, he's built well for it as well. And he's he's that passionate, the way we were talking about the bringing the culture and everything and not just being your run of the mill fan and immersing yourself. That's something that Graham does. He absolutely immerses himself in the whole culture of sumo and he wants to learn everything about it and he's he's not ignorant to anything and he's open to everything. And that's how I felt lucky and all when we became a team because that's the sort of view that I've got on it. Only Graham's right. got a much quieter approach to things than I have. I'm more loud and I'll talk a lot and I've already gave you a hundred ideas but only two of them are good sort of guy. <laughs> where I'm snowballing like that. So he's definitely had to listen to me and hear it, but I definitely think he's got, everybody's got potential, especially in amateur with the weight classes as well. So um, it's definitely something if people are interested in, even if, like you said, Coach, just a wee bit of Chico or something like that, just to get a feeling for it, it definitely people should try it. It brings yeah. a great se uh, self uh, no, a sense of self-worth and self-discipline and satisfaction. And I know that I feel good when I clash and I'm all right after it and everything's all good and I feel accomplished. So it's a great feeling and I've been bit with the bug. If you've got a, if you have a passion, this is my belief. If you have a passion, I don't care what it's for, collecting cards or, or playing canasta or, you know, uh, jumping off of mountains with, with a hang glider or, or doing sumo and, and in your brain becoming Japanese. Uh, if you have a passion that's not hurting other people and, and that rises your, your, your sense of life of living, of vitality, of vibrance, of, of being in the moment, and go for it. Just screw what anybody else might think about, like, t calm it down. Don't ever calm it down. <laughs> just To me, just let it rip, man. If, if that's what you love, just let them rip. And, Graham, I just want to say something to you, sir, um, directly to you, because this goes to everybody else that may be listening that has a slight peak of an interest in what's going on or what we're talking about. We can all love sumo and just watch it on TV and read all the books and buy some posters and put them on a wall and stuff and just and ex experience and enjoy that. And a lot of people, that's all that they're able to do physically or just with time and money or whatever. But if you have the opportunity to actually be around somebody that's practicing sumo and you go out and you can try and do tenshko and just see what it feels like or try a little bit of sudiyasu or just get down to skiri position or just try tucking your elbows in to see how your fighting might go or something. If you can get in the ring and break a little bit of a sweat, you don't have to be warring against anybody you have to be battling but if you just get closer to that doyo like i talked about being with the pros when you're there you can feel that if you just step around a doyo and i don't care if it's a if it's a rope and a hose spread out in, in a judo room in scotland it doesn't matter mm -hmm. if you can step around a doyo with people that are into sumo your appreciation your enjoyment of the sport will just block you know you got the seed it's, it's like uh, an iceberg you see this little thing going along, but underneath the water, man, there's this monstrous thing that's going on. So yeah, while you, you're sumo to other people, and this goes to you too, sir, when, when you're saying you're top knot or whatever it may be, they're seeing that, but you know underneath you've got this whole freaking Japanese persona going on or whatever. That just there's, And it's all good. It just It's okay. That That's how we improve ourselves, and that's how we go for the gusto. And, it's all about the gusto, I think, you know, whether it's religion or whatever, whatever your, your bag is, just go for it. If you want to be a priest, then try and be the bishop, you know, <laughs> try and be the pope. You want to be a sumatori, try and be the yokozuna. But, but just no matter where you get to in life, even if you're just going into holy water and blessing yourself, that's good enough if that works for you. But it's something beyond just uh, just existing, going to work, getting your paycheck, paying your freaking bills, take care of your kids, going to work. Nah, give you something that's like, wow, 
can't wait for Friday because I'm going to meet up with my buddies. And we're going to, mm. even if we're just drinking sake and talking about it, so that's better than not. <laughs> okay. But if you can actually start sweating a little bit and, and try some shko and try doing some of the stretches and the exercise, it'll make your body better and stronger. You'll live longer probably. And then if you really get into it and you start putting on weight, so then that, that may not be so good for your health. But, you know, but that's another story. You're not, at our age, we're not, we're not, or your age, you're not looking at doing that anymore. But I would say, Graham, mm -hmm. go for it. You know, you only get one time around. <laughs> we, mm -hmm. There's a popular song in America right now. Uh, Don't be falling in love as she's walking away. It's a country tune about, you know, a guy in a bar and like mm -hmm. have the boss just step up and ask her, hey, would you like to dance? Can I buy you a drink? Don't say, oh, I love her. And then she walks out the door and go, oh, man, I should have done that. You know, I lost. Right. It's the same with sumo. You know, like this is your chance. It, like it's now. It's today. It's this moment that you say, you know what? I'm going to commit to trying this. And like, like when they tap me on the shoulder in the, the, the bay, I'd say, you want to get up and practice? Like, no, but yeah, I do. I, I, my body <laughs> said no, but I don't know. Jump up, run downstairs, go try it. Man. So get your ass kicked and go back and say, look at the blood on my ear, man. It's all getting fat and my freaking nose is crooked now. Look, this finger no longer works. Fingers. I mean, they're so busted up, these fingers from, from just being just hammered around and joked. Nothing works anymore. They're all too many grabs on the washing and fingers breaking. When you get a good grip on the washing and you throw the guy and he goes over and you, you can't get your finger out. And, uh, there you stand up and go shit and you straighten it back out which, you know, <laughs> it's kind of crazy but you don't have to go to that but i'm just saying it's just live in the moment because the moments pass and before you know it, you can be 77 years old like me and just an old shit just on all you got is stories <laughs> yeah. so well coach while you can. i will that i think that that is some great advice and i loved your analogy that you gave graham there about the iceberg the, the tip is out the water, but there is so much underneath. Um, and that that does that is a great thing to say to anybody that's listening that wants to try in, not even just sumo, that dip your toes in the water at least. And that is exactly what I want to see for everybody around the world, the passion for sumo pouring out. Um, because sumo is my life. That's what I chose to do. I fell in love with sumo. And so that is my, my side thing, my hobby, my wee bit of a job, my, my sport, I do my everything because I chose that because this is what I fell in love with. I fell in love with the culture, I fell in love with the sport and I fall in love with the people all around the world that are involved. Um, so I, I, I couldn't agree more with what you said there and I'm sure Graham you've got to agree as well mate and I think that we're a lot further along than you may begin soon while we try now eh? Yeah I think so, I mean there's not many people that can like drop that kind of uh, a piece of advice. <laughs> That's the, the what Sumo teaches you is inside your heart and in your brain, you might have this explosion of emotions going on as you get ready for a tournament. But if you watch them, and I'm talking about the amateurs, the pro, you watch any good top level athlete, the, the top NBA basketball player that are going down for the big championship game, their mind and their body and their, and their heart, man, it's going like they're just so wired to go. But you look at them as just like this calm outer demeanor because you just, and that's what Sumo teaches you. Hey, dude, control it. Don't yell and scream and throw your shit up in the air. Don't, don't kick the dirt. Don't go and try and get a scrap with the guy after because he beat you or the, the referee you, you think made a wrong call. Deal with it. It's it's okay. Just get on with it. And uh, yeah, it, it's, I don't know. I'm rambling here, but uh, I just, I get really excited when I'm talking with you guys. Oh, you're definitely not rambling, coach. You're definitely not rambling. Everything you're saying is gold. Honestly, everything you're saying, if anybody's, and, and for everybody that is listening, it's great advice to be taking there. So you're definitely not, you're definitely not rambling. What you're doing is you're, you're giving everybody your opinion on life experiences that you've been through. Because you say you're 77 and just full of stories, but to me, and I'm sure to Graham and everybody else tuning in on this, that's not just stories. That is facts based on experiences that have built an opinion with, with truth to it. If that makes sense. If I yep. Did I ramble yep. there? Thanks. <laughs> I feel as, feel as if I said that backwards there. But basically, I, that's uh, you definitely weren't rambling. That was, that was some good truth bombs that, that I'm sure some people will enjoy hearing or need to hear um, uh, about sumo. Yeah. 
So I literally think that we have covered everything that... Because see, even the questions we had for you and all, Coach, you answered them and you couldn't have answered them better without even being asked. We didn't even need to ask you half of yeah. them. You answered them with the perfect answers. I literally... See, for most of this episode, I think me and Graham spoke for about three minutes between us all in. And it was brilliant because see see the stories we got to hear and the way you described it. Honestly, this has been just a great episode to have, Coach. Um, and we cannot thank you enough for joining us Lovely. tonight and telling this us these stories. It's truly my pleasure. Thank you. It's been been a wonderful thing to just to see your excitement and your knowledge of sumo, both of you guys, and your efforts to, to put this podcast together to... to it takes a lot of effort, a lot of energy, a lot of emotion, right. a lot of talent to do all this stuff. So mm -hmm. I thank you for, for helping promote Sumo and uh, get the word out a little bit more about what, what good Sumo is. <laughs> 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 right. Well, I appreciate well, thank that. Thank you, guys. Man. And uh, let's just chat again in the future, you know, and I... it doesn't have to be on TV or whatever, but uh, I enjoy talking with you guys. It's really enjoyable. And right. Graham, get your, Ocoli, get your Ocoli into that doyo. <laughs> Give it a shot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. So then we'll watch you on and uh, and just just give it a go. Then if you, yeah. if it's if it feels right, then just keep going a little bit more. And if it doesn't, then you know at least you can say, well, I I did put the wash on. Mm -hmm. I tried it. So uh, I get, like like Scott said, I grew up. Uh, this is like this is a non-interview thing. This is just um, yeah. like I grew up playing rugby. Like I've played all my life. My ah, right. dad and stuff. They're in the uh, British forces. Uh, my my dad, my uncles, my granddads, both okay. sides. So they all played rugby through the forces and stuff. So I played played like all my all my life. Uh, but as you know yourself, you end up just ruining yourself, don't you? Like just absolutely, you pick up an injury and you kind of keep playing with it. I, bro I broke my ankle halfway through a match. Hey. Strapped strapped it up. Because I thought it was a sprain, played the rest of the match on the wing, on the wing, rather than on the flank, and then uh, and then was back at training uh, at midweek training. I just thought I'd sprained it, took ibuprofen, and then found out three years later, I think it was, that I'd actually fractured my ankle and broke a couple of bones. So um, yeah, I'm just falling apart from all of that stuff. But uh, but but being a being a rugger, uh, you being a rugger. It's the it's the same feeling being a sumo wrestler. You know, it's just you go all in, and whether you get a ding or a bruise or a break or whatever, you just kind of tape it up, suck it up, and keep going. That's why all these people are saying like, well, the wrestlers, you know, it's not fair that that he's got a bad finger and they're still making a fight. And they're like, just shut up, please. <laughs> it's it just just the game, man. Right. It's a martial art. You know, it's a warrior class of people, so it's it's right. okay. It's a very honorable warrior class, but it's a warrior. It's a battle. It's a fight out there in the doyo. Yeah. It's the same on the rugby pitch. Mm -hmm. It's a battle. It's a war. You know, that's why I love the... Look what I'm wearing. I don't know if you can see this. The hacker. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> hacker or be yeah. See, I wonder. Like, Our high school players all do the haka for, before every football game. They always get a 15-yard penalty for doing it, but they do it because we got all these Polynesians from a lot of New oh, Zealanders nice. and Maoris and Samoans and Tongans and Hawaiians. And, uh, but they have that passion. So, yeah. You've got the sumo spirit. You just don't, right now it just says rugby on your heart. So you just got to race that and kind of <laughs> sketch in sumo. <laughs> the letters for sumo and it, I think it transferred pretty easily. It did for me. It transferred real well. I retired from rugby at the age of 31 in Hawaii. There were too many racial fights. Uh, the last 10 games I played in, the final whistle never went off. There were riots and like, it, we had 10,000 people on the sideline for just a regular Sunday game. And 9,990 of them were Polynesian. And then we had a few Caucasians. And I got pounded. I, I saw a couple of my buddies just stomped on. And they went to the hospital. One guy died. And I just, you know, I, I came this far not to die in the rugby pitch. And then a month later, I started into sumo. So I started sumo really late in my life, in the late mid-30s. But, uh, but, uh, but I still love rugby. You know, rugby done right is, is an amazing game. But uh, done wrong, it can also be just nasty. <laughs> Any sport like that. Yeah. Good luck, guys. Uh, thank you so much for your time and your efforts Aye. on behalf of us. Really, uh, really appreciate you speaking to us. Aye, really John, nice. we, can, we cannot nice thank you enough. Aye. We can't thank you enough. Seriously, no no need for thanks because I, I've had an absolutely lovely morning. So thank you. <laughs>
So, everybody, what an episode we've had tonight. It's been amazing talking to Mr. John Jacks. Um, thanks very much again for joining us, John. It's been really good hearing for you. And I hope all of you enjoyed hearing John's amazing stories and input and experiences a sumo amateur and professional over the years. Um, and we'll see you all in the next episode. Thanks very much, and we'll see you all later. Yeah, thank you, John. Aloha. Thanks, everybody. Aloha, guys. <laughs>